I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you for joining us today for our joint oversight hearing on age discrimination in the workplace, held by the Committee on Aging and the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. Just last fall, the, the committees held the first ever hearing on age discrimination in the workplace. And today's hearing is a follow-up on a number of pressing issues and critical pieces of legislation to protect our city's senior from age discrimination in the workplace. Today, the committee will hear testimony on introduction number 1693, 1694, 1695, all of which I am proud to sponsor. We will also hear testimony on introduction number 1684 and 1685, sponsored by Councilmember Ayala. During last year's hearing on age discrimination in the workforce, we heard disheartening stories from older adults about their experience being discriminated in the workplace. Sometimes this discrimination happens while an older adult is employed, Sometimes it happens before they can even get their foot in the door. Unfortunately, their experience are not unique. According to the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, during fiscal year 2018, age discrimination accounted for more than 22% of complaints made to the EEOC, with nearly 17,000 total complaints filed. The New York City Commission on Human Rights, or CCHR, reported that in 2017, about 2%, or just 193, of the inquiry filled by frontline staff at the commission were age discrimination inquiries. Of these 193 queries, 119 were related to age discrimination in employment. Despite the large number of inquiries received, CCHR filed only 29 claims of age discrimination related to employment that same year. These figures are incredibly low for a city of over 1.1 million adults over the age of 65. As acknowledged by the administration last year, these low figures may be because age discrimination often occurs during the hiring stage, which is very difficult for victims to prove. They may also be due to the fact that many older adults are simply unaware of their rights or who to turn to in order to file a complaint. At last year's hearing, the committees learned that the Department for the Aging, or DIFTA, and CCHR engage in a number of programming to increase awareness of age discrimination in the workplace, including providing frequent know your rights information, at community-based organization and senior centers. Despite the administration's effort citywide, seniors are enduring age discrimination in the workforce, and many of them are still not reporting these injustice. We cannot allow the current trends to continue. This is why I am proud to sponsor critical legislation that will move our city forward by providing important protection for older workers, older adult workers, and aspiring workers. Along with Council Member Ayala, I am proud to support and sponsor the age discrimination package. First, introduction number 1684, sponsored by Council Member Ayala, will require um, the City Human Rights Commission to create a poster on age discrimination, including how to identify it and how to file complaint, and require every city agency to display this poster. Introduction 1685, also sponsored by Councilman Vallela, would require CCHR to provide age discrimination training to city agencies. City employees would be required to make this training through their agency annually. Introduction number 1693, which I sponsor, would create a task force to study age discrimination in the workplace. This task force would be staffed by members of CCHR and DIFTA, the Department of Small Business Services, and other advocates and members of the business community. This bill required the task force to issue recommendation within 12 months 
about how the city can help to address and eliminate age discrimination in the workplace. Introduction number 1694 would create an office of older adult workforce development, which would be asked with coordinating and centralizing city efforts at connecting older adults to job and careers. And finally, introduction number 1694 would require CCHR to conduct investigation of age discrimination in the workplace in an employment testing program. I look forward to having a thoughtful conversation about the comprehensive package of age discrimination bills put forth by the committee and about how they might be made stronger. I also look forward to learning about the progress DIFTA and CCHR have made since last year's hearing with ensuring that incidents of age discrimination are reported by older adults and such discrimination is effectively addressed. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in organizing this hearing. Our counsel, Nusa Chaudhari, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, and final analyst, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Tohini Sapura. I also like to thank my legislative director, Marion Guerra, and also like to thank the other member of the committee who have uh, joined us today. Uh, we have council member Ballone, council member Diaz, council member Rose, uh, council member Perkins. And now I would like to turn the floor over to my co-chair, council member Eugene for some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, council member Chin. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Eugene and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. I would like to thank my colleague, Chairman Magai Chin of the Committee on Aging for making this joint hearing possible. Today, our committees will be hearing testimony on five bills that aim to tackle the issues of age discrimination against older workers. Even though New York City has uh, some of the strongest anti-discrimination laws in the country. We still hear stories about all the workers being discriminated against while either working or trying to gain an employment. Some of these issues were highlighted at the previous uh, joint oversight hearing we held on this topic last year. We have identified a range of legislation measures that can strengthen protection for these workers. Three of the five bills that the City Commission on Human Rights to develop a various measure to tackle age discrimination in the workplace. While we are acknowledging the great work that the Commission already does, we believe that this bill can give the city more tools to tackle the problem. For example, introductory bill number 1684 would require the commission to create a poster that explains age discrimination and provides example of prohibited conduct. These posters would then have uh, to be displayed by every city agency. Introductory bill number 1685 also focuses on education materials. It pa if passed, it would require the commission in conjunction with the Department for the Aging to develop a training and material on age discrimination. In addition to making this available on their website, the commission would also provide annual training to each city agency. Lastly, under introductory bill number 1695, the commission would be required to conduct testing, especially developed to identify cases of age discrimination. The commission already undertakes this type of investigation for other forms of discrimination, and it has helped detect many bad actors. The final, the final two bills, 1693 and 1694 would respectively establish a task force and office of all the adult workforce 
development to ensure that this issue remains a focus for the city action. We look forward to hearing testimony on the, this bill today from the Commission on y Human Rights, the Development for the Aging Advocates and uh, Stakeholders. Before we begin, uh, I think that my colleagues have been recognized already, but now I would like to thank the committee staff, Belki Miri, Senior Counsel to the Committee, Leah Scrapik, Policy Analyst, and Nevin Singh, Finance Analyst, as well as my staff, David Swice and Jim Fagan. Now I would like to turn it back to uh, my co-chair, Margaret Chin. Thank you, Chair Eugene. Uh, we would like to call up our first panel, uh, Amanda Farinasi. Farin Marisol Seda, uh, Vivian Lee, uh, David Gottlieb, and Julia Almate Sachs. Okay, advocate first. Please identify yourself before you testify. You may begin. Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Marisol Seda, and I am 52 years old. Okay. Thank you for inviting us, Honorable Council Member Margaret Chin, members of the Women Caucus, all of you, for the introduction of this historic legislative package. I came here to cover your work, but I never imagined having to be on this side. I know by experience how essential and vital is your work. I have no doubt that this is needed, and the need is urgent. I hope other, other cities follow your leadership, your commitment with senior workers, our livelihood, and how it consequently affects our families and even the economy. I also want to publicly thank my lawyers, Brian Heller and Dan Covell from Schwartz, Perry and Heller, for their commitment to justice. When researching gender and more specifically age discrimination, what I have found has been appallingly and discouraging. Here are some phrases, and you can find them all over the internet. Proving age discrimination is difficult. While you might think you have an airtight case, the odds against winning could be low. What's more, you could wind up paying a high price, not just monetarily, by going to court. More phrases. Even if you have rounds for a suit, career experts say going to court could be a mistake. Suing your employer for age discrimination is basically playing Russian roulette with your career future. You burned your bridges and might never get hired again. Imagine this, you're in your 50s. You have kids in college with student loans. The situation is so difficult that when they graduate, you tell them that it is okay to come back and live in your basement. But then you're discriminated by age and gender. I heard this story multiple times, too many times. Our society is aging. The system is broken. And not only for senior workers, but for young workers who have recently graduated with intense 
debt, student loans while watching their parents suffer a huge life change, not being able to fulfill their basic living needs. I'm gonna say some things in Spanish as well, if you allow me to. Y encima de todo, viendo a sus padres sufrir emocional y eventualmente físicamente porque no tienen para pagar sus necesidades básicas. And this is basically a translation. I graduated from the University of Puerto Rico School of Public Communications, magna cum laude, in 1990. I founded the Association of Journalists, Journalism Students and was awarded a leadership award at my graduation. But I started working in 1989 at one of the main media in my beloved Puerto Rico. My country has extraordinary journalists. I have worked as a reporter, investigative reporter, on-air talent, producer, news director. Producers, news directors, and videographers are journalists too. I've been a senior video journalist. I have supervised newsrooms. I've been a content strategist, consultant, speaker at the Excellence in Journalism Convention on how to establish an investigative and consumer unit. I have multiple Emmy nominations for Emmys, and I can keep going. I'll add something else. As I've been, I have served as a member of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences in two boards in Chicago Midwest, for the Chicago Midwest chapter and for the New York chapter. I'm a journalist at heart and to the core. And I have never in my life seen the bold manner in which my former employer destroys careers based on gender and age. Furthermore, and worse of all, how they choose to close their eyes and ears to the loud multiple cases, asking them only to investigate and to change their ways. En español. La manera descarada y abierta en la que mi pasado empleador ha tratado y en consecuencia destrozado las carreras de grandes periodistas trabajando en distintos roles por su edad y su género. Peor aún, la forma irresponsable que ha intentado ignorar los pedidos de buena fe, in good faith, y los reclamos de múltiples empleados. That is why I, was, I also want to thank Roma Torre, Janine Ramirez, Kristen Shocknessy, Amanda Farinacci, Vivian Lee, Talia Perez, Michelle Greenstein. You have exposed yourself. You have been vulnerable. You have had to endure great distress to also pave the way for a new future. Thank you. You're courageous, brave, seekers of truth, which is who we are as journalists. Your actions are shedding light to what needs to be exposed, discussed, resolved. And in Spanish, mis respetos y admiración y mi abrazo para todos ustedes. And my, my invitation to other broadcast journalists to come out, to expose injustice and advocate for change in our industry and to other people, because this is epidemic. Many corporations and institutions have beautiful statements about their core values. They talk about integrity, respect, about diversity, and diversity is also great. 
but it is only a pretty statement to show in paper, not demonstrated in actions. Finally, I want to remind American civil rights activist and poet Maya Angelou's words. Each time a woman stands up for herself, she stands up for all, all women. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. My name is Vivian Lee. My name is Amanda Farinacci. I'm David Gottlieb uh, from Wigdor LLP, attorneys for Ms. Farinacci and for Ms. Lee. I'm Julia Almalay Sachs from Wigdor LLP, attorneys for Ms. Farinacci and for Ms. Lee. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's been a long day so far. Thank you to Council Member Margaret Chen and the entire City Council Committee on Aging for inviting us to speak to you today. We are very grateful to this committee for choosing to shed light on the critical issue of age discrimination in our city. I am 44 years old. I am a reporter and anchor at New York One. For nearly 20 years, more than half of them at New York One, I've covered issues revolving around or stemming from the work of this city council and its committees. I sit before you with my longtime colleague and friend, Amanda Farinacci and Marisol Seda. And as you well know, Amanda and I along with three of our colleagues, Roma Torrey, Kristen Shaughnessy, and Janine Ramirez, have filed a lawsuit alleging systemic age and gender discrimination against New York One, which is owned by Charter Communications. Charter employs thousands of employees in New York State and tens of thousands across the US. Starting in the fall of 2017, a movement took hold in this country Women started coming forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against numerous powerful and seemingly untouchable men. These courageous women helped give others the strength to come forward, who in turn gave even more women the courage to speak out. Of course, I am talking about the Me Too movement, which has been life-changing to women here and around the world. More on why this informed our commitment to fighting ageism in a moment. During the same time period, I began experiencing blatant age and gender discrimination at New York One. I soon realized I was not alone. My co-plaintiffs and I are all anchors and reporters, and we have been there for 10 years ranging from 11 to 27 years. So collectively, more than a century. However, after Charter took over New York One from Time Warner Cable in 2016, we became marginalized in every imaginable way. New primetime anchoring positions were created and given exclusively to younger women and men. Prime anchoring slots, which had previously been ours, were also given to younger women and men. Promotional efforts were focused entirely on younger women and men. The list goes on and on from there. The complaint we filed in court is more than 80 pages long with examples. We made numerous complaints to management about this conduct and were all repeatedly told, essentially, to stop complaining. Many people have asked us whether we were scared to file a public lawsuit. And the answer is yes. Without a doubt, we all love what we do informing New Yorkers about the important issues of the day, what to think about, what to care about, what's happening down the street from you. And over many years, we had all gotten very good at our jobs. We never expected to become the news. But what was scarier is what would have happened if we did nothing. And the lessons of the Me Too movement helped to give us the courage to come forward and tell our story. 
Media coverage of our case and support from various organizations who fight for gender equity have expressed how the issues raised in our lawsuit, while different from allegations raised in numerous Me Too stories, are undeniably related. Separate, but linked. The common denominating factor between our case and Me Too as, is that women are not treated as equals. It is no secret that TV news has long disfavored older women, but we perhaps naively felt it wouldn't happen to us. I, Amanda, and my fellow colleagues naively thought things would change by the time we approached middle age. But men are still allowed to age with dignity and grace. Gray hair and wrinkles give them more gravitas while it makes us more disposable. I only wished that when I was in my 20s, I wasn't lulled into thinking ageist discrimination would never affect me. And we know our industry is not the only one where these stereotypes are felt. We sympathize with all women who are looked down upon and treated as second-class citizens as they age. Thank you, Vivian. Um, good afternoon again. My name is Amanda Farinacci. I am also a reporter and fill-in anchor sometimes at New York One. I am 40 years old. As Vivian stated, we are so grateful to the City Council and to the Committee on Aging for introducing legislation that will help combat age discrimination in the workplace. We are honored and eternally grateful to be given the opportunity to testify before you today and hope that our lawsuit has helped to shine a light on this serious and pervasive problem. I can tell you that in 19 years of work at New York One, I have covered literally dozens of these hearings standing right over there on the other side of this room. I never ever in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be any place else in this room besides on that riser reporting on the issues. And obviously because of the urgency and the weight and importance of this issue is the reason why I'm now part of this testimony. By creating a task force to study the consequences and of discrimination in the workplace and requiring the New York City Commission on Human Rights to investigate ageism, the City Council is sending a powerful, powerful message to employers like New York One that ageism has a very real impact on employees like Vivian and me and Marisol and our three other co-plaintiffs. In addition, the bill's mandate for the City's Commission on Human Rights to develop training materials that would help identify, prevent, and eliminate age discrimination in the workplace gives us hope that New Yorkers will become increasingly aware of, aware of and sensitive to this problematic and unlawful form of discrimination. As Council Member Ayala noted in her statement, uh, age discrimination disproportionately impacts women. And as Vivian mentioned, we've witnessed this firsthand. It is personal for each of us who have come forward with this suit, and I can guarantee that if you bring this issue home to your families, to your friends, to women coworkers, to anyone in this room, you will find a woman who can identify with this problem, and you're shaking your heads, and this is personal for all of us. So this is a conversation that is far too long in, in being spoken about. Clearly this issue at its core is a women's rights issue because it especially affects women. The problem really, if you dumb it down, is that nobody gets younger, but we all get older. Those 20-year-old women who are replacing me on air today will one day be me. They'll be 40, and they will be thrust aside in favor of men and women younger than themselves if we don't take a stand and highlight this issue now. So once again, we like to express our thanks to this committee for doing just that, for giving us an opportunity to speak about this, and thank you to everyone who is here today sharing their inspiring and their brave personal stories. It is. You think I know about microphones by now, right? It is truly unfortunate that our society continues to be reluctant to place value on older workers, and especially 
on older women. As the number of working, the older adults continues to grow in our city, it is our hope that we as a community will increase our respect, our appreciation for both men and women of a certain age, and that employers will learn they cannot discriminate against someone for their age. We commend Council Member Chin for leading the fight against age discrimination and introducing this crucial legislation, which will help to destigmatize aging by bringing it further into the public discourse. Thank you for your passion and hard work, and we look forward to seeing our city lead the country on this issue. I wanted to really thank the panel, um, and especially um, all of you who testify, and thank you for your courage, and thank you for supporting our fight, because we have to, once and for all, eliminate age discrimination. Ageism should not exist in our city. And I look forward to continue to work with you for justice, you know. And older workers, our numbers are growing. Mm -hmm. So we thank everyone for joining us today and, and thank you for testifying. We're also joined by uh, Council Member Lander. Uh, we, we're not asking any question. Okay, I won't ask a question then. I will just say thank you to the chairs uh, and thank you to the panel for your courage in bringing this testimony forward. I, you know, I just, I turned 50 a few months ago. My wife is turning 50 shortly, but we're, you know, not as young as when we started, but I can feel distinctly the difference in the ways that aging affects how the two of us are related to in the workplace um, and the ways in which age and gender discrimination compound um, gets clearer and clearer and, and we have a responsibility, uh, men especially, to stand up and join in the cause and I just want to say thanks to all of you and thanks to Margaret and I be signing on to all five of these bills. Great. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity also to thank uh, all of you in the panel for your courage and also for your advocacy because you are speaking for many other people who cannot be here to speak. You are speaking on their behalf. But there is something very important that I believe that uh, Ms. Marisol said that express the difficulty to go forward and to fight against the age discrimination when you are working. Mm -hmm. And also you mentioned something very important that, and I was thinking about that also, you say it in Spanish, you say that uh, the children and they see the, the padres sufrir. And you say also that uh, there are consequences, consequences destrozas. So that means the impact or the result of fighting for your right as a worker can be really a big challenge that will affect people not only financially but also emotionally, mentally. And this is a big issue that I believe that all of us, we have to come together to fight against. Thank you again for your courage and your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we would like to invite up the administration and thank you to the administration, Department for the Aging and the New York City Civil Rights Commi Commission. We have Maria Serrano from DIFTA, Eka Yu from DIFTA, Dana Sussman, uh, Deputy Commissioner of New York City Human Rights, and Sapna Raj, yeah, uh, New York City Human Rights, Deputy Commissioner of Law Enforcement. Oh, we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, the Council will sway you in. raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, Chair Chin, Chair Eugene, and members of the Aging and Civil and Human Rights Committees. I'm Edgar Yu, Chief of Staff at the New York City Department for the Aging. 
I'm joined today by Maria Serrano, Director of DIFTA's Senior Employment Unit. Uh, on behalf of Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony again on the important subject of age discrimination in the workforce. I'm also joined uh, this afternoon by Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs, and Sapna Raj, Deputy Commissioner for Law Enforcement, both at the City Commission on Human Rights, CCHR. DIFTA recognizes the broad intersectionality of age-based discrimination with other protected classes, including gender, gender identity, race, citizenship, and disability, just to name a few. We also acknowledge that this type of discrimination unfortunately transcends sector and industry. Thus, DIFTA is grateful for CCHR's partnership in our ongoing work in this area and their enforcement of the country's most robust human rights law. As DIFTA testified in September of 2018, before these two committees on this very topic, combating ageism is among the department's top priorities and remains an important part of our commitment to serve the 1.64 older adults who call New York City home. Rather than simply reiterating last year's testimony, which in detail described our senior employment programs and services, um, I will provide a brief update on those services and then share the commissioner's commitment and efforts in combating ageism across all the ways we work to ensure older adults are safe and thriving. As you know, beyond the wide range of DIFTA programs and services, including our network of congregate centers, case management, home delivered meals, caregiver resources, geriatric mental health services, older adults can avail themselves of services through our Senior Employment Services Unit. This includes the Title V Senior Community Service uh, Employment Program, CSEP, and the Reserve Program. Through the federal grant-funded CSEP, income-eligible New Yorkers age 55 and older can access job training, job placement assistance, and other invaluable services, all while earning a wage. The program has partnership contracts with 400 community-based organizations, nonprofits, and city government agencies to offer our Title V participants subsidized placements for up to four years. Additionally, our job development staff work with 300 business entities to facilitate unsubsidized placement of our participants, which is the ultimate goal of this program, direct employment. Through these critical partnerships, participants are directly integrated into the workforce and offered real life professional training opportunities and experiences. Among the most common job types are home health aid, security guard, and administrative assistant. In fiscal year 19, a total of 440 Title V participants were placed in community assignments or direct employment. For over a decade, DIFTA has also partnered in, uh, been a partner in the reserve program through which retired professionals, referred to as reservists, uh, can be placed in short-term assignments to help one of our employment uh, partners fill critical gaps. Reservists often have background in law, social work, teaching, accounting, foundation outreach, and IT administration. The term for these assignments typically range between three months to 12 months, with the option to extend um, based on the need of the assigned agency. Uh, at present, the city has 242 reservists. Beyond these core uh, senior employment services, DIFTA also pr uh, provides opportunities for older adults uh, to engage in meaningful civic causes through our foster grandparent program. New Yorkers age 55 and older are offered a paid non-taxable stipend to serve as mentors or tutors or caregivers for children and youth, some of whom have uh, special needs. Our foster grandparents serve 20 hours per week at community-based organizations, such as daycare centers, after-school programs, elementary schools, and hospitals. In FY19, we had 321 foster grandparents placed at host sites across the city. While the city is home to 1.64 million older New Yorkers, as I mentioned earlier, we are keenly aware that this population uh, is projected to reach 1.86 million um, by 2040, which represents a, oh, more than 20% uh, growth. 
Uh, this workforce and civic engagement programs intend to increase opportunities for these older adults to remain in the workforce. With the growing population, however, uh, there is an increased need to ensure we have the right approaches and supports to first prevent ageism and then address instances that occur. Moreover, since DIFTA's employment, uh, senior employment population is overwhelmingly women, uh, older women of color, that need and the other related factors at the root of discrimination is exponentially larger. In our ongoing effort to uh, combat this problem, all of our employment participants, in addition to job retention and career advancement support, receive annual mandated equal uh, employment opportunity trainings uh, and on uh, identifying ageism and how to get help uh, if faced with age-based discrimination. Equally important is our work uh, uh, with our uh, participating employers, uh, which are carefully screened and selected to ensure that they are case, uh, rather age sensitive, age uh, competent, and recognize the incredible value and benefits older workers bring to their organizations. We firmly believe that this exposure and experience with um, older workers benefit our employers far beyond just the Title V placement. The City of New York is itself a participating employer. Uh, the New York City Department of Education, Human Resources Administration, Department of Parks and Recreation, and over a dozen other city agencies um, serve as uh, partners in our CSEP and offer placement to our participants. Additionally, DIFTA uh, regularly hosts public forums and presentations on ageism awareness and prevention. Our, commission, our commissioner sees combating ageism and making New York a city for all ages a core tenant to her vision. Um, she has, uh, since stepping into her role, worked uh, not only to maintain important interagency partnerships, but to consider new avenues to support older adults uh, through our uh, sister agencies. Most recently, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez participated in CCHR's Stakeholder Roundtable, which convened community-based organizations and advocates um, from across the city to discuss the subject of age discrimination. These interagency collaborations underscore the administration's years-long commitment to combating ageism. On behalf of Commissioner Cortez Vasquez, thank you for, this, uh, for your advocacy. Uh, we are incredibly grateful to the Commission on Aging as well as the Commission on Civil and Human Rights for championing this important issue. Um, the Council's partnership is a critical part of the City's response to ageism. We also acknowledge the Council's uh, intent and the package of these bills um, to uh, introduce to address age discrimination, particularly intro 1693 and 1694, which directly implicate DIFTA and our work in this area. Uh, there's great alignment, uh, it seems, with, uh, between DIFTA and Council in this regard, and we look forward to our continued dialogue with the Council to discuss the nuances, practicality, and implementation implications of these bills. Uh, thank you. Uh, following Deputy Commissioner Sussman's and Deputy Commissioner Raj's testimony, Maria and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, before I begin, I'm just going to go a little bit off script um, and just um, convey our appreciation to the panelists um, before us um, who really crystallized for us some of the, the core work that the commission is doing and, um, and just personally dedicating my career um, now over a decade of working on gender justice related issues and anti-discrimination issues and seeing how um, there is a, a, a true intersection in vulnerability for workers based on gender, based on race, based on disability and other protected categories, um, and that there's a recognition that while we've had age protections in the city human rights law for decades, um, sometimes law precedes culture shift. Um, sometimes it's, it's, the, it's the standard bearer and, and society needs to catch up, and in other ways the law needs to catch up to society, and I think we are in one of those moments where this has been the law on paper for, for a very long time, and we are in a moment, and thanks to many of the people in the room here today, we are understanding in some ways for the first time the depth 
and the complexity of this problem, and I think um, need to think very creatively and strategically about how we address it. So um, that was not in my remarks, um, and I'm sure my colleagues are, uh, their pulses are racing, but I will now go back to the, the scripted remarks. Um, uh, so good afternoon, Chairs Chin and Eugene, and members of the Committee on Aging and Civil and Human Rights. I am Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, and I am honored to be joined today by my colleague, Sapna V. Raj, Deputy Commissioner for the Law Enforcement Bureau at the agency. I'm also honored to be sitting next to my colleagues, Edgar J. Yu and Maria Serrano from the Department for the Aging, um, key partners and collaborators in this work. Thank you for con um, convening today's hearing on intros 1684, 85, uh, 1693, 94, and 1695, five pieces of legislation that seek to address age discrimination in the workplace. Before I turn to the legislation, I wanna highlight some of the commission's recent work. Um, as you know, the commission is the local civil rights enforcement agency that enforces the New York City human rights law, one of the broadest and most protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws in the country, now totaling 26 protected categories across nearly all aspects of city living, housing, employment, and public accommodations, in addition to discriminatory harassment and bias-based profiling by law enforcement. Over the past four and a half years, since Commissioner Carmelin P. Malalas took the helm of the agency, the Commission has implemented 28 changes to the New York City human rights law, including seven new substantive areas of protection and other statutory expansions of the agency's mandate and scope. At the same time, the Commission is increasingly becoming the preferred venue for victims of discrimination. In fiscal year 2019, the Commission fielded nearly 10,000 inquiries from members of the public via calls, emails, and in-person intakes, the highest in Commission history, resulting in 785 complaints filed and 396 pre-complaint interventions. Also in fiscal year 2019, the agency obtained over $5.3 million in damages for complainants and nearly $800,000 in civil penalties paid to the General Fund of the City of New York for a combined total of over $6 million, the highest in the Commission's history and over five times the amount of damages and penalties recovered in 2014, the year prior to the start of Commissioner Malalas's tenure. In the past two fiscal years, age discrimination cases accounted for nearly $1.3 million in damages and penalties assessed. Over the past two years, the Commission has filed 110 cases on behalf of individuals alleging age discrimination, and the vast majority of those cases are in the employment context. In one case, an employee alleged that he had been terminated because of a policy that stated that the company could not hire or employ anyone over 65 years old. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau investigated the matter and tried the case at a hearing before the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, or OATH. After considering the ALJ's report and recommendation, the Office of the Commissioner and Chairperson at the Commission issued a final decision and order, awarding over $70,000 in compensatory damages, including back pay, interest, and emotional distress damages, imposing a civil penalty of $30,000, and ordering respondents to modify their policies and undergo training on the city human rights law. The Commission's Community Relations Bureau, which engages in outreach and education on New Yorkers' rights and obligations under the city human rights law, has partnered with community-based organizations throughout New York City to provide information to older New Yorkers on their rights. And as you may be aware, the Commission pub regularly publishes materi materials in multiple languages and conducts training and outreach on discrimination and other protected categories to audiences across the city. In fiscal year 2019, the Commission conducted 38 trainings focused on the rights of older New Yorkers in partnership with organizations such as SAGE, Deshi Senior, Senior Center, St. Jerome's Hands Community Center, Rain Senior Center, Griot Circle, and many others. In addition, Commission leadership spoke at several forums and events on age discrimination throughout the year. Most recently, as my colleague mentioned, on September 16th, the Commission, along with, our, along with DIFTA, convened a roundtable with age justice stakeholders and experts to discuss how the Commission and DIFTA can work more effectively to combat age discrimination in the workplace. 
Many of the advocates and stakeholders here today were present for a rich conversation highlighting the protections offered by the city human rights law and discussions on how the commission can best serve communities most vulnerable to discrimination and harassment. And finally, later this month, attorneys from the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau will be training DIFTA staff on the city human rights law to ensure that any potential discrimination cases they come across are properly identified and directed to the Commission. Turning now to the bills that are the subject of today's hearing, Intro 1684 mandates that the Commission create a poster addressing age discrimination and requires that all city agencies post it in common areas for employees. I'll note that the Commission has created a notice of rights that includes information about one's rights broadly under the city human rights law, covering all 26 protected categories and is updated whenever we, we adopt a new protected category. As part of all case resolutions against both private and public entities, we require respondents to post this notice of rights in areas visible to employees and or tenants or customers. Intro 1685 requires that the Commission create a training that city agencies must complete once per year and post information on the Commission's website about age discrimination, how to report violations on the, on the Commission, and, and, uh, excuse me, and available venues for relief and action. In, intro 1693 establishes a task force to study age discrimination in the workplace, chaired by the Commissioner of the Commission or her designee. And Intro 1695 establishes a testing program targeting age discrimination in the workplace. The Commission supports the intent of the bills and in recognition of the fact that age discrimination is pervasive, the Commission is actively engaged in policymaking, enforcement, and outreach to, for, to highlight the protections under the city human rights law with respect to age discrimination in the workplace. Further, many of the Commission's current efforts and future initiatives reflect many of the bill's goals. As I mentioned, the Commission regularly provides training to different audiences in dozens of languages across the city and conducts workshops and outreach to older New Yorkers. The Commission's outreach continues to expand. In fiscal year 2018, the Commission served nearly 100,000 people through these outreach activities. In addition, the Commission is already mandated to publish an annual report every year on, on September 30th. Um, and our latest annual report is here and on our website, and we encourage you to read it. Um, in that, we are required to report on the number of public inquiries received and in what language, commission initiated investigations, complaints filed, commission's education and outreach ed efforts during that fiscal year. Um, we welcome the opportunity to work with council to to further our shared goals of aggressively promoting and the rights of and protecting older New Yorkers in the workplace. And my colleague, um, Deputy Commissioner for the Law Enforcement Bureau, Sapna Viraj, will now highlight some of the Commission's law enforcement efforts. And after that, we welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sapna Raj, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Law Enforcement Bureau at the Commission on Human Rights. I currently oversee a team of 71 attorneys and supporting staff who, on a daily basis, uh, field hundreds of calls, email inquiries, walk-ins, schedule appointments, undertake investigations, litigate cases, and test for discrimination on behalf of New Yorkers who have experienced discrimination and harassment. First, it's important to note that the New York City Human Rights Law offers far more protections than the federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which is also known as ADEA. Under the ADEA, plaintiffs must prove that their age was the but-for cause of their discrimination. That is, it is not enough for a plaintiff to show that age discrimination contributed to the adverse action. Rather, they must show that age discrimination was such a motivating factor that the adverse action would not have occurred absent the discriminatory motive. This is a standard that is purposefully difficult to meet and unlike the standard under the New York City Human Rights Law, is not aimed at completely eliminating discrimination from the workplace. The heightened federal standard only exists with respect to age discrimination claims so that individuals alleging age discrimination have a higher bar to meet than members of other protected categories who allege discrimination under federal law. By contrast, the New York City Human Rights Law treats age discrimination the same as every other protected category. And as mentioned earlier, there are 26 such protected categories under our law. 
The New York City human rights law protects against mixed motive di discrimination, meaning that a plaintiff may prevail if age discrimination contributed in any way to the adverse action. Notably, the New York City human rights law protects both employees and job applicants from age discrimination, whereas under federal law, there is a circuit split on whether the ADA covers job applicants. More importantly, for hostile work environment claims under the ADEA, the conduct must be severe and pervasive versus the New York City human rights standard of simply being treated less well because of someone's age or other protected status. In addition, the ADEA has several affirmative defenses written into the statute that employers can use, such as the bona fide occup occupational qualification of the job or that the policy differentiates among workers based on some reasonable factor other than age, such as seniority. The New York City human rights law does not have any such affirmative defenses codified in the law. The New York City human rights law also offers more comprehensive remedies to plaintiffs. Those who have been unlawfully discriminated against based on their age under the law are entitled to many kinds of relief including economic damages, emotional distress damages, and depending on the forum, punitive damages. Unlike under the human rights law, claimants under the ADEA are not entitled to receive emotional distress or punitive damages. As you know, the commission has the power to initiate its own investigations when entities are suspected of engaging in discriminatory policies or practices. In addition to filing complaints and deploying testers, the Commission sends cease and desist letters and also uses a range of investigative methods such as requests for information on data and policies and practices, demands for documents and interviews of key witnesses. In our experience, each of these investigative tools serves an important role in detecting and proving claims of discrimination. Under Commissioner Malalas, the Commission has significantly expanded its Commission-initiated actions. For example, in fiscal year 2019, the commission, commission initiated 56 actions compared to 33 in 2015. All Commission-initiated actions are referenced and explained in each annual report issued every September. We welcome information about possible targets of these Commission-initiated actions from Council members community groups, and other, any other entities concerned that discriminatory practices may be taking place. Thank you for the opportunity to, about our, to speak about our work, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we just want to follow up um, from last year's um, testimony that we were only able to get statistics for 2018. Uh, so maybe you could tell us in terms of the commission, how many age discrimination claims uh, has the commission received in 2018 uh, from year to date? And then uh, can you disaggregate uh, the claims for us? Um, and also highlighting whether, you know, how many of them are related to age discrimination and... Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so actually, in, um, are you just talking about the number of claims that we've gotten, the type of discrimination? In fiscal year 2019, we had 68 claims that involved age discrimination that we, set, we conciliated or settled. 68. I'm sorry, yes, settled, yes. That was settled. Can you just give us a little bit more in terms of the, the example? I think that's really important for the public uh, to hear, because in your testimony, um, uh, Dana, in your testimony, you talk about one of the case, one of the complaints where you actually, you know, got a, uh, a settlement, and, uh, but that was kind of blatant. They say that their policy is that they can't, they don't hire people over 65. I mean, that is so blatant obvious, right? But in terms of some of the other cases that you have um, received and investigated, can you maybe just give us uh, a couple of highlights? So um, age discrimination cases, as has been said before, are historically difficult to, to prove. 
Um, and I think that's where the commission-initiated actions that we can take, other than testing, would actually be more effective, in my opinion. Um, I came to the commission and uh, joined the commission about three years ago and started the testing program and made it pretty robust where we've done about 900 tests last year. Um, age discrimination typically is very difficult to prove through testing. I think it would be easier for us to investigate uh, age discrimination through other tools that the, com that the commission has, um, like sending out requests for information where you get to ask how many people do you have that you employ in this, uh, you know, what are the age ranges, and then you can ask what, was, what has it been in the last five years, so you get a, 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 a feel for how many people uh, have been hired, how many people are currently uh, working there, why people left, and through uh, interviewing witnesses, you would get more information than from just testing. And testing can really be done only at the hiring uh, stage, not while people are actually working at the companies. I mean, how many testing cases have the commissioner, I mean, the commission done focusing on age discrimination? So we have not actually done a lot of age discrimination testing. Um, like I said, I think it's more effective to do uh, use other tools that the commission has in its uh, um, in the law that we can use. Um, so we haven't actually done a lot of testing, but we plan to actually do some testing to see how it uh, progresses as the, in this fiscal year. Well, that's one of the bill, is to ask the commission to do a certain number of, of testing. Um, and then this way, at least we could get some information at the front end where people are prevented from even getting the job, right? I mean, some of the other uh, tools that you mentioned, that's great that if people have concern about when they're working, that if they know that the commissioner can actually do some investigation, uh, there's other ways of doing it. So the investigative tools can also be used to find out what happens at the hiring stage. So you can find out how many uh, folks have applied for jobs, applicants have applied for jobs, and what their age ranges were and what happened to the people who applied for jobs. So it's not just for, for, for the employees who are currently employed or who were employed, but for the job applicants too. Would it be difficult for the commission to do a testing program based on uh, finding about age discrimination? So historically, it's been very difficult, um, not just at the commission, but any other enforcement agency to actually find discrimination or to determine if there is dis discrimination through testing in, for age discrimination more than any other uh, category. For example, if you're testing for Fair Chance Act discrimination, it's easier to find that out. Um, as you know, discrimination is very subtle and with age discrimination, what happens is that there may be other factors and other protected categories that may influence why a person is hired or not, um, that may not make it very clear whether it's age um, itself that's the reason for someone not being hired. But would the commission be able to start doing a program uh, that, that do testing on this, that since you already have a testing program, so we're, we're not asking you to put in additional resource by like a, a special focus, you know, for targeting, um, investigating on discrimination against older workers. So we can, I just am not sure whether that would be um, something that would give you the, the correct um, idea of what's going on with the hiring. I, as, as someone who's done a lot of testing uh, for the last 10 years or so, I think the other tools that we have would actually be more effective in determining whether there is age discrimination in the workplace. Okay, I mean, we will continue sure. to um, discuss with you on that. But I, I just want to just follow up what I asked earlier in terms of some other examples sure. um, that you were able to investigate and get, um, and get settlements uh, for people who were discriminated against. Um, so age discrimination is not always, as, as you said, um, that it's not always very clear uh, and overt. Uh, so there have been other cases, I can't, I can't tell you the exact uh, details of each, but there, uh, through our investigation, we have f investigations, we found that there 
they were discriminated against because of age and maybe another category, but under the New York City human rights law, it doesn't matter if it wasn't just age. So unlike the federal law, as I said, it doesn't matter. So we did find after investigations that we, after the investigation that there was discrimination and then the cases settled because our, in, our evidence was pretty strong and people did not want to take it to trial. So you can not give us kind of some real life story that can, that people can understand and, and take back and say, oh wow, this happened to me or this happened to my friend that I, I can actually do something about uh, to go to the commission and file a complaint. I can highlight um, just one that I'm aware of. So we, we post settlement highlights on our website every two months um, and we put pretty detailed case summaries up on the website. And um, again, I'll, I'll try to summarize from my recollection, but there is one that highlights um, the intersection of age and gender in which um, uh, a worker, uh, an older worker, a, I believe a woman, was facing um, some remarks in the workplace was also, I think, forced to, was essentially forced out or forced out of her position, was replaced with someone younger. Um, the remarks mostly focused on her gender, but that um, I think was, there was also sort of a mixed motive behind that, and that case resolved in a, uh, a settlement for the complainant, um, where there were sort of uh, gendered remarks but we think she was also targeted potentially based on her age and the fact that her position was replaced with someone um, younger uh, sort of demonstrated that for us. Um, but if you'd like more detail, I can, um, I can get that case summary to you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to know that you do have it on, on the website so we can let people know that they can look for these examples. And so you t what are some of the other tools that you use and you could highlight to really do the investigation? So the request for information is I think one of our most effective tools um, where we will ask to find out what the policies and practices are and what the data is in a particular company. So that's not just with age discrimination, we've done that, we've used that for sexual harassment, we've used that for gender discrimination, um, we've used it for disability discrimination where we ask uh, an employer or a provider of public accommodations or a housing provider to give us that information. Once we get that information, we may ask for more information or we may determine that we want to file a complaint on behalf of the commission. Um, those, that information comes, to the, it's from the tips that we get either from the public or from elected officials or from advocacy organizations that we start the, initiate the commission initiated investigations. So that's one tool. The other is we, if we know that a specific employer is uh, engaging in discrimination, we send out cease and desist letters and tell the employer to not only stop doing what they're doing, but tell them to respond to us within a certain time period, usually it's five days, and then to change their practices and we set out how they need to change the practices. Once they, come in, uh, once they um, have a um, dialogue with us, then once we settle the case, we will enter into a stipulation and order, which is then signed off by the commissioner. Of course, we can always file a complaint um, and then investigate further if, that's, if that is warranted. Great, I have one more question before I turn over to my co-chair. Um, you heard the first panel, yes. right? In that situation, is this something that the commission can do with the tools that you mentioned earlier? I mean, it's so blatant that it's happening there. Um, so, yes. Um, so, what's important to note is that the New York City human rights law is available for people to use, whether they come to the agency, to the commission, or not. So, people can take the, a claim under the New York City human rights law and file it in state court. They can file a federal claim under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and add a state claim, uh, a city claim. Um, a local civil rights claim in federal court. Um, and so there are, this law allow, is, is available to people whether they come to the commission or not. From what I understand, the earlier panelist's case is not at the commission but filed in court. And that is an option for people to choose their venue, to choose to come to an agency. It could be the City Commission on Human Rights, the State Division on Human Rights, or the EEOC. Um, there are options for people. Um, and so 
that is certainly, if, if the panelists had come to us with those allegations, we would absolutely accept that complaint and investigate that case and, um, and work to either resolve it through a conciliation or, to pr or prosecute it and litigate it through the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. It's really um, an option for complainants to decide how to proceed with their claim. What I'm trying to get at is that, you know, the complaint, they went another route, but the commission like, can you do your own investigation because of certain, you know, information that you've gotten that things are, you know, happening that shows that there were signs of gender discrimination, age discrimination. So can you call up or like request from the company information? You know, how many people they hire, age and promotion and all that. We can and we have in other cases where we have determined that the commission wants to step in. Uh, we have investigated companies on that basis, yes. But in this case? In this particular case, we did not. Um, it's something that we will consider. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass it over to my uh, co-chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Chin. Uh, we know that uh, it is very difficult to justify a claim you know, to say that, that this is a uh, age disc discrimination, you know, uh, case. So you know that uh, what uh, decision, what step has been taken to address this particular issue? We know that it's difficult to explain and to justify that this is truly an age discrimination, you know, case. What? Uh, step you have been taking, decision or strategy or planning that you are doing in order to be able to better justify the claim? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, what work on the law enforcement side or um, in individual cases or? In the law enforcement side, or in the, you know, the, the Commission of Human Rights, we all know that it is very difficult to justify that when somebody comes to you and says, you know what, I've been discriminated because of my age. So we know that it's difficult to justify that. And especially, I think the federal government has taken, passing a legislation to make it more difficult. What are you doing to have the necessary tool to make sure that you are able to, to justify the cases? Sure. So the as um, my colleague mentioned, um, age protections under the city human rights law are as strong as any other protected category. Um, we know that the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, um, pursuant to a Supreme Court case, has uh, it, its protections have been gutted essentially, um, and you know we want people to know that they can avail of the city human rights laws broad protections if they work in New York City or are seeking a job in New York City. Um, so that allows us to apply that same standard of treated less well then. And as we've talked about in many other protected categories, that may mean um, that you think that you're not getting a job because of your age or membership in another protected group, you can come to our agency and we will ask the employer um, for information about their hiring practices, about their recruitment practices, about the, the, the numbers, the age breakdown of their current staff. All most, uh, more often than not, discrimination cases are difficult to prove. They are fact specific. Sometimes when we don't have overt what we call stray remarks or actions that are overtly discriminatory or words that are overtly discriminatory, we have to look at sort of all of the, the, the environment in which um, the, the workplace and the hiring um, and the retention exists. And that may, that may require that we look at the demographic information of, of the people in, in that workplace, um, their, again, their hiring practices, their recruitment practices, um, and, their, um, and their retention practices. So it, these are not easy cases, even with a generous standard that the city human rights law has. And every case is unique and involves sort of different dynamics um, and that are, that are fact specific and will come out through an investigation. You mentioned in your testimony, Ms. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, you, you mentioned in your testimony that you 
the commission has been working with other partners in the community, in a non-for-profit organization. Can you, you give us some more detail about the partnership, what you are doing together, and how successful has been the partnership? Sure, so our partnerships with community-based organizations um, really run the gamut across all five boroughs. It may be that we, um, we have our law enforcement intake team out at a community-based organization on a particular evening or weekend to um, meet with community members on specific issues, whether it's uh, discrimination based on LGBTQ status or uh, sexual harassment or source of income discrimination in housing. Um, we do a lot of Know Your Rights um, and Know Your Obligations outreach in communities. So we often will partner with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, um, Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, other agencies um, to get out in communities um, at community-based events, at tabling events, at community forums, um, and provide information, materials, on-site intake um, to ensure that we are meeting communities where they are at. If council members know of communities that would want us to be present for a particular event or even in district offices, we are always available to be there. Um, we almost, I, I am not aware of times that we've had to say no to an event. We are wherever we are needed um, in communities and building um, community trust has been incredibly important to us. So we have hired staff from the communities that we hope to serve, from the community-based organizations that we partner with um, to host different events and convenings to share information about their rights under the city human rights law. So you say that you have hired uh, staff from the community and uh, could you tell us what is the process to hire the staff and what is the process also to select the community-based organization? How do you select them? Um, so selecting community-based organizations, it's really just um, we sort of assess who's doing the work in the communities that we want to have a presence, um, and it's building those relationships. Many of our staff come with key relationships to community-based organizations, um, and that's one of the sort of Many, one of many prerequisites is to have uh, you know, relationships in communities that we hope to serve, to speak languages that the communities speak. Um, and we uh, either invite those community-based organizations in for roundtable discussions um, to build partnerships and collaborations, or we meet them at their uh, offices and locations um, throughout the five boroughs. Um, and we just build our relationships from there um, and work to ensure that we are present. We, we rarely, it is our hope and aspiration that we rarely meet you once, that, that we create a sustained and long-term relationship and continue to show up. Um, so there isn't really a specific selection process with respect to the community-based organizations with which we work. It's just building relationships and building trust and credibility in communities that might not had, have had relationships with government before. I know that uh, uh, the commission in my office, we, are, we have partnered and we have had civil uh, even in the community and that was successful and I commend you for that and I appreciate that. But uh, uh, for DIFTA and also the commission, we know that uh, the, the older workers, when they are discriminated because of their age, the impact is not only financially, it is emotional also, it is a mental, but what do you have, either DIFTA or the commission, what do you have to help the older workers go through this very difficult moment in terms of you know, support services, training, to help them cope with this very difficult situation? Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're, you're exactly right. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult situation and, and a support system, uh, one that is very connected to our sister agencies and, and other services throughout the community is uh, incredibly helpful. Um, but before I, I proceed, I, I really sort of want to give context a little bit um, as far as uh, our universe of senior employ em employment participants. Um, we have, knock on wood, yet to receive any age-based discrimination claims. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean none have happened, um, but um, 
in fact, none have been formally uh, brought to DIFTA's attention. None of the participants in our CSEP program has brought that to our attention. Um, is that because um, of, of the employers that we've worked with are trained and are age friendly, perhaps, um, but uh, this universe of folks, um, our seniors, our older workers that we work with through these programs are trained annually on identifying ageism and understanding how to um, uh, uh, seek uh, assistance if they're faced with discrimination. So I just wanted to sort of um, preface uh, our response uh, with that sort of context. Um, as far as, uh, again, coping, um, I think it's incredibly important to avail yourself of all the services that DIFTA, I, I listed, a, a rattled off a, a series of, of services and programs, um, including geriatric mental health. So these are, and we're, as you probably know, or as you well know, we're expanding our geriatric mental health program through, across our, our network of senior centers. So these things are available for folks. Um, and we have, again, a very strong interagency partnership. So if, if one is to claim, uh, make a claim of age discrimination, we'll make sure we connect them to the appropriate agency, including CCHR. Anything else? Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Maria Serrano, I'm director of the CSEP uh, Title V program, also known as the Senior Community Services Employment Program. And I um, want to thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to all Madam Chair, Chin, and members of the City Council for this wonderful opportunity to um, help in uh, battle the problems of age discrimination in, in the workplace. Having the opportunity to manage the CSEP Title V program is one of the most wonderful experience that I've had. Uh, as also as a senior uh, worker, we feel that uh, we are granting a lot of education to our participants in the program so they can identify and they can know that they are protected and they cannot be discriminated. We also are promoting information in basically every area of the program to make sure that they know that they, they, we are working with employers who are very, very well, well uh, uh, knowledge, knowledgeable that the CSEP Title V uh, program it's for seniors that are seeking to reemerge in the city's workforce. Uh, to that event, um, we are also working with the State Office on Aging to make sure that uh, the non-discrimination policies are clearly stated throughout the handbooks and material that the participants receive. We also work with partners throughout the city of close to on over 300 community-based and government agencies as well as nonprofit organizations that are well, very much well aware that our participants have this level of protections. So um, more so the employers are very much uh, aware that the Department for the Aging is promoting a safe workplace for uh, their workers and a safe uh, work for the seniors that they will be uh, hiring during the process. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my last question. I will be back to you before I turn it back to my co-chair. Uh, we know that, that there's a great partnership between DIFTA and the Human Rights Commission, right? You are working together. Could you all give us more detail about this partnership and what each one you are doing? Are you corporate? Are you help each other in order to be in better position to help those uh, uh, older workers? who are facing discrimination? Um, sure, I'm happy to. We, um, our partnership kind of spans different areas of what we do. So on the policy making side, we are um, in the, we are consulting with DIFTA on um, releasing legal enforcement guidance on the, in, on the area of age discrimination in, in the workplace. Um, we convened a stakeholder roundtable just last month, um, co-led by uh, Commissioner Malalas at the Commission on Human Rights and the DIFTA Commissioner as well to bring together um, experts and stakeholders to talk about age discrimination in the workplace and what information we should be putting out in the world to make clear what the protections are in the city and how employers can comply and not only comply but um, 
but promote best practices for employers in fostering a multi-generational workforce. Um, on our outreach and education, we partner with DIFTA in making sure that we are out in senior centers that DIFTA sort of oversees across the five boroughs, and, and they help us identify uh, senior centers that might be appropriate for different um, programming and outreach. Um, we also um, partner by, we are now training um, DIFTA's frontline staff. I believe later this month, our law enforcement bureau will be training um, DIFTA staff on New York City human rights law um, and specific areas of focus so that they have the tools that they need to identify potential cases and, and forward them on to us. Um, um, uh, in addition to that, clearly we have a really strong partnership between our two agencies. There are a lot of uh, other agencies with whom we partner very regularly, particularly in this area. Um, SBS uh, in particular, we have a direct MOU with a uh, small business service. Um, DYCD, also an incredible partner in this space and offering uh, slots for our CSET participants. So there's a lot of interagency work happening and all coordinated, all really uh, with a shared goal. And I'd like to add that we also, the Department for the Aging, is sponsoring what is called the New York Region of CISA Providers in New York. And we meet quarterly to sort of promote the best, best practices and the support of the seniors in the city. And these partners are really committed to also um, support the fact that our seniors cannot be um, discriminated during the job search process. And just to mention some of those, that's the Easter Seals, the Jamaica all the for, for all the workers, uh, the workplace, uh, also uh, the Urban League, and a few more. Korean community service? Uh, and, I know. It's <laughs> <laughs> and they're doing community services. I know that uh, DIFTA and also the Commission of Human Rights, you, got, you are doing all the effort you know, that you, you can to help people you know, the, the older workers, you know, in terms of, you know, discrimination in the workplace. But uh, uh, the language barrier in New York City is a reality. It is something that we see every single day and everywhere. And we cannot expect you to hire people from who speak all the different languages in New York City. And I've seen some of the time in public forum people who don't speak English properly and sufficiently, they go to those forums with the hope they are going to have some assistance. But after the forum, they don't have a clue some of the time of what we were talking about. Uh, some of the time they go to offices, they go to city agencies with the hope they are going to have to receive assistance for their issues. But you know they didn't get what they were expecting. How do you handle this very important issue? You know, when you have uh, people who don't speak English, or when you are uh, providing or hosting a public forum, and there are people who are not proficient in English. Sure. Do yes. you have people in your staff who speak several languages, I, I believe? I, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, this has been a, a key priority of Commissioner Malalas. Uh, when she arrived uh, four and a half years ago, staff at the agency spoke less than 10 languages. Um, currently, staff at our agency speak over 30 languages. For an agency of our size, that is quite significant. Um, and we know that that is you know, but a fraction of the languages spoken in New York City. Um, so we always have um, our staff trained and ready to call um, language, our, our language line vendor, um, so that they are served immediately in the language that they speak. We are always working to improve, but this is a key priority area for, um, for our agency and our commissioner, and we have prioritized hiring staff that speak the languages of New Yorkers so that they can learn about their rights and then realize their rights with someone who can speak their language. Um, and when we do host public events, we always ensure that we have staff who speak the language of the of the community that we're in which we're situated, and also that we have um, on-site, in-ear 
um, contemporaneous interpretation um, in the language of the community so that even if we have one or two staff members who speak that language, we ensure that they are able to access that information um, in, in their language immediately. Um, and we um, you know, used some of our uh, budget several years ago to prioritize the purchase of those, uh, those that, that the, the technology in order to be able to do that and have that and not always um, you know, borrow it from Moya or borrow it from other partners. So we have that capacity in-house. Thank you very much. Thank you to each one of you. Let me turn it back to uh, Co-Chair Sheen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. And uh, oh, we've been joined by Councilmember Trigger. Uh, Councilmember Lander, you got questions. Thank you to both chairs and, and thank you to the panel for this work. And again, thank you for the, for the first panel for really calling our, our attention. Um, it's, so you guys have, have testified very well both about uh, what we're doing to get at discrimination um, and with the model programs DIFTA has uh, in between our city agencies themselves and those nonprofit partners we contract with where there's like an opportunity for people to be affirmative employers. And I wonder, you know, what are we doing both to make sure that we don't have discrimination in our own city agencies and in the many, you know, wonderful nonprofit and human service and for-profit agencies that the city contracts with? Um, are there things we're doing there both to push them to be uh, affirmative employers participate in these programs, but also make sure that we are uh, making, you know, uh, making sure people comply with the law and are, uh, are, you know, are affirmative as employers to the full extent that they can be. Um, so if the question is around sort of raising standards across city agencies and those entities we contract with? Yes. Um, Sure, I can speak a little bit to uh, the Commission's work on education and outreach with our sister agencies. Um, we uh, have a catalog of trainings, not only sort of know your rights or know your obligations trainings, but also building inclusive workplaces and affirming workplaces um, in a whole host of different areas. Um, and we uh, often ask our sister agencies if we can come in and present. Um, and sometimes we are asked and we welcome those opportunities to come in and talk to our sister agencies, not only as employers, frankly, but as um, public accommodations, as providers of services to the public and how to do so in, a, uh, in an inclusive and culturally competent way. Um, so we offer those opportunities to sister agencies uh, all the time. And, um, and we have created, um, to that end, uh, a statutorily mandated training on sexual harassment that city agencies can use. They can also use the DCAS um, developed training, um, which is now a statutory requirement to be completed every year. Um, so we have a history of doing, well, a, uh, a recent history of doing this work, and we continue to build out that catalog of training that we use both for private entities, non-city non employers, and also with sister agencies. Um, and, I, and we've partnered, I, I believe, as well with, um, with DIFTA on ensuring that folks who are entering the workforce um, that DIFTA, who, who work with DIFTA in getting placed, know what their rights are with respect to, the, to city human rights law protections as well. Um, yes, she's, she's exactly right. In, in addition to some of these interagency partnerships, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, work with hundreds of private businesses to also really uh, create a, a culture shift in, in many ways in, in their organizations. So these, this direct exposure and experience with older workers really, as I mentioned, is having a, a much greater impact, sort of grassroots or organic impact on uh, the organization as a whole, we continue to work and identify other partners. If you have any private entities that, that are um, interested in working with mature workers, we're happy to do that. We actually have a job fair, if I may just quick one plug, on October 18th, we're actually hosting a job fair uh, where uh, more than 200 seniors or older adults looking for employment uh, will be directly engaged with dozens of uh, employers looking to, uh, to hire them on. So we're really excited about that. And um, I want to push a little more on the agencies we contract with, um, you know, where we might have opportunities through how we write those contracts or what we ask them to look at, um, you know, and sometimes since those wouldn't be civil service uh, positions, they have, you know, somewhat more flexible hiring. That can be good, but it can also uh, be bad. Uh, I just wonder to what extent whether we're looking at 
um, the network of, of organizations the city contracts with, both as an opportunity to participate in the DIFTA programs, but also, um, you know, push them to be really, you know, to engage in best practices. I can say that um, the CSEP program, it's basically contracted with over 300 community, 400 community-based organizations to deliver employment and training support to the seniors in the program. To that end, the commitment is also that they practice good practices of employment. Um, we educate them. Each year, we're meeting with them. We are uh, sort of expanding the resources that we have with them to avoid any form of discrimination in the workplace and to educate them as well while, while, they, while they are supporting our Title V participants uh, at these locations that they understand the protections that they are driven by. So all this information, it's made available to the host agency partners and th that are in contract with the CSEP Title V program. So, uh, yes. so that's great, but I guess, my so those organizations that have decided to be CSEP partners seem like they would be the ones that would be most inclined to want to partner here, and I'm asking about you know, the agencies that contract with the city for the wide range of other service provisions who we, you know, would be a good audience with which to push a little harder if they don't yet have not yet become C-STEP partners or, you know, what things could we do to um, use that great opportunity to absolutely. keep moving people along. You're absolutely right. Creative ways to sort of impose these things on, on folks that we wouldn't um, ordinarily have the opportunity to. I think you're right in sort of uh, the RFP process might be a perfect opportunity to, do some, to, to think through some of those things and we're absolutely open to that. Okay. Um, for two questions for the commission. Um, uh, you, you've since, you know, since Commissioner Malala started, done a lot of, built a lot of testing work uh, that didn't exist before in housing and employment, uh, some, you know, out of really, uh, legislation this council's passed and some that you've decided to do on your own. Have you learned some things in building up the practice in the testing work in housing and employment that would be useful to apply in the situation of rooting out age discrimination? Um, you know what? What are you know? What are some of the things we're learning in that work that we would want to apply here? So I think one of the good things about the testing program is that we found that in the vast majority of tests that we have done, there hasn't been uh, evidence of discrimination, which is a good thing. Yes. Um, but there is enough discrimination that we need to address and handle. Mm -hmm. um, I just also wanted to uh, answer quickly um, a question that council. Uh, woman uh, Chin had about the cases that we have. I just wanted to talk a little bit about a, a couple of cases. Um, one of them was where a person was asked when they were interviewed, um, most of the people who work here are in their 20s. Would that be a problem for you? Um, another person who came to us was um, told she was already in her job and she was told that you don't seem to be very good at computers. Uh, and learning the software, so she was kind of eased out of her position because of that. Mm -hmm. So those are still more blatant than than the subtle forms. I think the subtle forms are more um, uh, can be can be determined more easily when we do the commission initiated work than than doing the um, complainant based work. And I guess one question on the testing work, you know, I can imagine some, some things that would be discovered by um, applicants in person, like what you just said about are you comfortable with all the 20-somethings. I can imagine, you know, comparable resumes, like some things are about does an older worker get in the door, so might the testing work include preparing comparable resumes where the age was all that was different and seeing over time whether um, you know, older applicants don't get the, the interview. So we haven't done the age discrimination testing, actually, yeah. but um, That's why we have the historically what has happened is that kind of testing has been done as projects by um, different groups, uh, sometimes academic in institutions, and they've sent out like 1,300 resumes to different uh, companies to see what comes back. 
but that just, they found actually that may show a trend, but does not necessarily show that there is discrimination as to a specific company discriminating against a person, because as I said before, it's difficult to um, separate out age, what, whether it's age discrimination or whether it's some of one of the other protected classes that may have had an influence on it. When you're doing testing, you're trying to do it almost like a scientific experiment where you're trying to isolate whatever it is that you're testing and everything else remains equal. Um, it's harder to do that with age than with other uh, protected categories. For example, with Fair Chance Act, it's easier to do that because someone can, you send in as a paired test, if you're doing a paired test, or you can even do it as a telephone test. Um, someone says, oh, by the way, I've got a criminal record. Uh, is that going to be a problem? It's kind of hard to say, oh, by the way, I'm 55. Is that a problem or not? People are not going to respond to you in the same way is what, we found, what people have found as they would say in a Fair Chance Act testing. Because if you say you have a criminal record, you get a response saying, no, that's not an issue, or it depends when it really, sh that should not be the answer that you get, um, depending on what the job is. Um, or someone who says, yeah, that is a problem. You know, I don't think that employer wants someone who has a criminal record. Okay, but then I guess assuming that we pass, uh, now I can't have lost the numbers, but the, the intro that does the testing program, what are, I mean, what are the testing models that we would use uh, you know, I understand the reasons why this would be more complex, but uh, you know, right. I think if we, if our suspicion is there are employers who are less likely to interview older applicants, you know, so, what what are the things that we're going to do through testing to try to get it? So we would do the paired testing where we would send somebody who has who's much younger and someone who presents as as older, um, and ha give them similar resumes and see whether there's a difference, but you're going, you know, whether there's a difference in who's hired. Um, I still think that the uh, request for information is a much better tool for us to use, but I mean, we could do the tests, and, and I'm not sure what we would, what would come, come out of those tests. Well, and I wonder, and, and then I'll ask my last question and turn it back over. I, I what we would learn and where we would have an enforceable case right. might be different situations, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do the testing. So I, I could imagine we might, you know, if we did 1,500 resumes across some companies and they came back in ways that, you know, were not surprising but were disturbing, it, it might be that we didn't have a case against any of the particular employers, but if it showed us a big trend and, you know, it might be worth doing the testing with an eye not only to bringing enforcement claims, but I mean, you could still publish the list of employers you sent, you know, like we, we sent out 1,500, they came back, it is, you know, here's the, the evidence collectively of discrimination, here's the 14 employers that we sent it to, we're getting more serious about age discrimination, even if we don't have, as you say, you know, a slam dunk case on some tech company that, you know, we think is, needs, right. to, needs to evolve on each. So I think we should be careful about publishing the names of people that we sent the test to, because it may not be really clear that it's because of age. There may be many other factors. When you go in for an interview, it may not necessarily be because of your age. It may be that you didn't come across as a good interview. You, you know, there are many reasons that someone may not be chosen. So I would be a little reluctant to... Well, all I would say here is I, I hear you using your in, enforcement, your law enforcement powers judiciously. And I agree that if you don't, if you're not ready to say a particular employer engaged in particular actions that are evidence of discrimination, but, you know, l let's imagine the world where we did the study and it came back with clear evidence across the entirety of the field that there was discrimination. I don't know why it wouldn't be bad to say here's the 20 employers that we sent uh, applications to. We're not going to tell you which one. We're not, we're not bringing enforcement claims, but across the group there was that issue. We'd encourage the people that care about those employers to say to them, what are you doing on this issue? Uh, there might be ways. I think this is just goes to your point that this is a challenge. On the one hand, this is a challenging field around which to make the same kinds of cases that we sometimes can in other areas. But if we know there is pervasive discrimination we want to push on, then we need to be creative and come up with some ways to push employers collectively 
So I guess let me just, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think there would be some ways to use testing methodologies um, and to use tools that are somewhere in between a very broad education of everyone should do better and we've got a case right here that shine a spotlight on the issue and kind of push us all forward. So I'll, I'll just, I'll ask my last question uh, now, <clears throat> which is I was peeking at the 2019 mm -hmm. Andrew report, which looks great uh, and really speaks to increasing work in a lot of different ways. Um, it speaks to really good work dealing with caseload management and some creative solutions to trying to uh, settle things earlier, to close old cases, like it, it really reflects um, doing all you can with the resources that you have while we keep assigning you more work to do and you want to do more work uh, and therefore kind of information and caseload responsibility keeps growing. Um, despite all of that, it does remain true that the average case processing time was up again last year on the year before, which is not surprising when we assign you more responsibility and don't give you enough resources to have more people to process all the cases even if you are taking a lot of steps to try to address caseload management with the resources you have. But to me, looking at the numbers in the mayor's management report and the 2019 report, it remains the case that despite all you're doing, because we're assigning you more and not giving you more resources, it takes longer on average to process a complaint. And if we're going to give you more work, which I'm in favor of doing in these bills, um, it would be incumbent on us to give you the resources to do that work in a way that didn't lead to lengthened processing times. So um, would you like to take the opportunity to talk me out of the, that perception or, or not? No comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, you know, obviously, Mr. Chair, you've been, you've been a good you know, uh, advocate on this as well, but I just think every time we add a responsibility to the commission, even if it's a really good and important one that we're mindful that unless we put more at the budget time, get them more staff to process the complaints, then what that means is people that bring complaints are gonna be waiting longer for justice. So that's not a reason not to do more, that's just a reason for us to all work together as you have been a leader on, but I just am saying for the public and for all of us, when we do these things, we've got a responsibility to make sure we get them more resources to keep doing this work. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member uh, Linda. You know, you inspire me. You know, you bring a question to my mind right now. So I know uh, Council Member Linda have been talking about budget is, and I think uh, previously in one of the uh, public hearings, I did ask the question, and I'm going to ask it again. What is your biggest challenge in addressing this very, very important issue? What is the biggest challenge that you are facing? Um, so I think that in an F, you know, there are certain, as an enforcement agency, as a law enforcement agency, um, we are governed by our statute, and our statute and our rules create a process, and that process is, can be really lengthy, um, and it's, it can be lengthy for good reasons. It ensures due process, time for respondents to respond and answer, a rebuttal to be submitted, um, for the evidence to be weighed and assessed and gathered, um, but for people who are either in crisis situations, need because they are about to lose out on a housing opportunity because they have a voucher, or because they have a disability and are um, unable to use their uh, bathroom in their in their apartment because they have a disability, or uh, a pregnant worker who is about to be um, terminated because she's not getting the accommodation she needs to maintain a healthy pregnancy. We the, the tools, the sort of the the process that is built into our statute doesn't account for those crisis immediate uh, interventions that we often are faced with. And so what we've done is we've created this pre-complaint intervention process. Um, and we've built, we've identified, we've we've moved staff to to respond to those cases more urgently. We have created a, an entire uh, process for that. So if we get a call from someone who is still currently employed and facing, um, you know, a disability accommodation issue or a religious accommodation issue or a pregnancy accommodation issue, um, and they need an urgent intervention, we have created. Uh, the mechanism by which we can get on the phone and start doing advocacy and saying, are you aware, employer, that you must provide a reasonable accommodation 
unless you can show that it, prove, it, provi it, it causes an undue hardship. Um, and in, many, in some of those situations, we are able to keep that person employed. The last thing we want is um, you know, someone to go through a full process with us only to learn that had, you know, we could have maybe done an early intervention and kept them employed rather than um, get them damages after the fact once they've lost a, a job due to discrimination or the failure to get a reasonable accommodation. So I think we struggle with addressing systemic discrimination, which we know exists on a large scale, which requires long-term investment in complaints and investigations, and issuing decisions and orders that state broad um, policy and take bold positions, with also this need to address the urgent needs of New Yorkers every single day who are facing unstable housing or a complete lack of housing because of discrimination or the fact that they may be pushed out of their job at any moment um, because of, or, or are facing a daily onslaught of, har of harassment in the workplace. So it's really the struggle to balance those two things. And historically, the agency has had not done that rapid response, um, but our commissioner um, and the staff really felt strongly that we needed to be, be more creative and be more nimble to respond to the needs of New Yorkers, and so that's what we're, what we're doing, but it's this constant balancing to ensure that we're doing both. We're doing the long-term sort of uh, addressing sort of systemic patterns and, um, and taking those bold positions and also working to meet the urgent needs of New Yorkers every day. Thank you, thank you very much. I do understand your answers, but there's something you didn't uh, touch at all. Let me get back to uh, uh, Councilmember Lender. In order to provide the best services possible, some of the time, you know, resources are necessary. Efficient staffing is necessary. So that means that uh, my question to you, do you believe that if you have more resources in terms of budget, increase of budget, will you be in the better position to address those issues? And I think I asked this, this question before, but nobody you know, gave me the answer. Because we do know to be in the better position to provide a good service, we need staff, we need resources. Have you been able to identify any budget need in the commission that will allow you to better serve those people that are facing age discrimination in the workplace? Um, well, we are grateful that, you know, four and a half years ago when we were before these committees, we had a staff of about 55 at the agency. And thanks to the support of the council and the administration, our staff numbers have um, nearly tripled. Um, and uh, so the work of the agency, is, as reflected in, in our remarks, um, you know, we have um, recovered almost five times the number of damages and penalties at this agency in fiscal year 2019 than we did in the year prior to Commissioner Malalas's start. And that is in large part due to the incredible work of um, Deputy Commissioner Raj's team, the increased staffing and resources, um, and the, um, you know, the, the increase, the rising of the standards of investigations and prosecutions and thinking more creatively about how we um, look at pattern and practice cases, we look at um, broad investigations, um, those also take time. Um, and so I think that for every additional attorney that joins um, Deputy Commissioner Raj's team, that's a caseload um, of cases that can move um, because we have more attorneys to move those cases. So again, it is a struggle. We want to be a visible presence, and I think our presence and visibility has grown as we have grown, um, and that's uh, you know also dedicating efforts to do community outreach and education, um, to be present on social media, um, but that results in more people coming to the agency. Um, so again, it is it is something that we that we struggle with. We know case processing times are lengthy. We are constantly working to address that without giving up doing good and thorough investigations. Um, so um, I guess to answer your question, every new attorney we bring in gets a caseload, um, and, uh, and, and, and that allows more cases to, to move along in, in, in the process. Thank you very much for your answer. <laughs> Thank you. Let me turn it back now to Councilmember Chen. Thank you. OK, I guess during budget time, we will have to get it out of you. <laughs> Councilmember Treg had a question. Yes, thank you uh, to both chairs, I think, for a very important and timely hearing. And um, 
just a couple of quick questions, and look, I think there's a lot of learning and follow-up work that it's a part of this process, but just a quick question. If, um, I'm a big believer that we need to model the behavior that we expect others to follow. Would you agree that the city, as a significant employer itself, needs to model the behavior that we expect to see? You know, is, is, that, is that fair? Yes. Thank you. Um, do we know how many seniors serve as commissioners in New York City government? I guess the, def well, I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I have the number off the top of my head, but it would also depend on how you define senior. Well, that's, I was, that was my next kind of question. Okay. Is, there, is there a definition of, of senior? Do, do, we have, do we have that? Sure. Uh, senior form DIFTA's perspective on a variety of our programs is 60 and older. Um, there are a whole uh, number of programs, including those we described today, where it's 55 and older. Right. Um, so, uh, sort of depending on which particular program we're, we're talking about. It's, it's an interesting question about how many folks who are 60 and over serve in senior positions in governments, commissionerships, deputy commissionerships, and so forth, because again, that's a part of modeling the certain expectations. And I look at, for example, one agency's policy. Um, I'm going to share with you very briefly, this was uh, written in a publication, The Gothamist, in June of 2019, so earlier this year. It says, a high-ranking NYPD officer took his own life on Wednesday, just a few weeks before he was set to face mandatory retirement because of his age. Uh, the According to reports, the 62-year-old police chief had submitted his retirement papers one day earlier after 39 years on the job. The NYPD's mandatory retirement age is 63. Are you familiar with the NYPD's mandatory retirement age? Yes, I think um, generally speaking, we're aware that certain um, uniformed agencies, I think, pri um, primarily have statutory, from what I understand, mandatory retirement ages. And what are we doing? I mean, this is a chief that served his city, continued to serve his city till his last breath, and they, according to a published reports, they believe that the reason, big reason why he chose to painfully take his own life was because he was told by the government he had to put in his retirement papers because he was turning 63. I'm not sure we can um, sort of comment on the intricacies of these. I think they are longstanding um, statutory requirements. I think we are open, certainly, to being part of the conversation with our sister agencies and the uniformed agencies around um, sort of the, uh, the historic justification for these and, re and revisiting them. But in your, in your professional opinion, do you believe someone at the age of 63 can, can serve in the NYPD or in serve, is serve in an agency? Um, I, again, I can't comment about the NYPD's processes, um, their job expectations, but what I can say is that um, the vast majority of, of um, positions in the private sector and in the public sector do not have mandatory retirement ages. And I do think that the presence of mandatory retirement ages in certain uh, sectors does contribute to, I think, this sort of accepted notion that we are now challenging that you get to a certain point in your, in your age, in your career, and you are no longer a useful member of the workforce. And I, so I think that we are open to having this dialogue around um, around these the notions that we are cha here to challenge and to talk about today. Um, and I think in the case that I had highlighted in my testimony where there was that policy that they wouldn't hire or, um, or employ anyone over the age of 65, that was a private sector employee. But I think because there has been this sort of longstanding uh, in certain sectors, mandatory retirement age, that employer didn't think it was so overt. It was sort of this accepted principle in, in their mind that you could 
that at a certain point you are no longer useful, quote, quote unquote useful. So I think that this is part of the conversation well, um, today. I mean, and, and that's, I think you've kind of made my point because how can the government point fingers at the private sector when we have such problems in our own government? I mean, that's exactly what I was getting at. Um, I think this policy is outrageous. I think this policy does discriminate uh, based on age. Um, this person, according to what I'm reading, did not have, he was a, a stellar public servant. And, and, and I, I, I think that we need to look across the board at all agencies and all levels of government to make sure that we are not hurting people because of their age. It's outrageous. And so I, I uh, and I would venture to assume, I don't know, do you know the year of that statute when, when that was written? I, I'm not aware uh, of that, of the year, but um, I believe it is pursuant to state law. Right. Um, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a conversation that we're happy to engage with, with our um, counterpart, you know, our, our partners in the administration that handle state legislative affairs and think about. Um, but I, I will share with you respectfully that I'm a part of the process every year with, with City Hall from the council and the mayor's side on our Albany agenda. Not once did I ever read this issue on the agenda to go up to Albany and advocate for a change in that law. Maybe I missed it. I like to read it. I didn't see it. Maybe the chair saw it. I didn't see it. But I think this needs to be a part of our agenda to go up to Albany and not just shake hands and take pictures, but actually effectuate change. Because I think this policy is hurting people and actually in this case, I think contributed to this chief's death, which was preventable. And so I, I, I appreciate your work. I know it, it, it's, it's not, this is an important job, it's not easy. But I think that we need to self-reflect in the city government. Are we doing enough internally to make sure that our policies are, in, are aligned to the expectations that we have of the private sector as well? And I thank the chairs for their time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger. Uh, I just want a couple of follow-up questions. Um, so how many, um, in the commission, how many staff do you have um, that conduct investigations? Mm -hmm. And then what are the caseload per staff? Um, so uh, the, the testing unit has four testers at this point and one testing coordinator and I'm the one who oversees the testing. So usually testing uh, programs have 50 to 60 testers and you pull from that testing pool um, according to the tests you wanna do. Mm -hmm. um, that's not how the city sets it up, so we have only four testers. At this point, we have six slots, so we're gonna be filling in those slots, but there are six tester slots for us. Don't you train volunteers or recruit testers? Because I remember doing fair housing testing a long, long time ago. We recruit testers and train them and then send them out into the field. But if you only have four testers, you can't do that much. So I, I think, and um, we can get back to you in the details on this, but I think it poses some challenges to have volunteers um, due to civil service um, issue, uh, you know, concerns around um, taking on work that m might be done by um, people that we would hire through civil service titles. But then when you contract with community-based organization, they, they train volunteers. I mean, not really volunteer, they give them a stipend or whatever. They do train people uh, to be tested because that's where you get the variety, people with different, you know, ethnic background, language, and, and all that. But what I'm asking about investigation, not just testing, okay. you know, the, all the staff that does complain that, that yes. comes in and, and how many, like, um, all the attorneys that you have. Right, so like our How many do you have and how many cases do they have to handle? So our attorneys are our investigators. We don't have separate investigators. So our, in, in our attorneys take the cases when the case comes in at intake. We have an info line that does an initial intake, but if there is if it's found to be jurisdictional, then an, they get an, the person gets an appointment with an attorney, and that attorney then um, carries the case all the way through trial if need be, or through conciliation, or if the case is dismissed because there, there is no claim there. 
Um, we have, I think at this point, we have 71 staff. Um, and out of that, 45, I think, are attorneys. Um, the rest are administrative staff. Okay. And in your, in your testimony, um, you're talking about over the past two years that you filed, the commission filed 110 complaints um, on behalf of individuals alleging age, dis, uh, age discrimination. How many of those cases were resolved? And then what happened to the case that are still open or not resolved? Out of, I'm sorry, I said, so, so six, um, if, I, if I may, sorry, it, the numbers, it's a little bit apples to oranges because the cases that were opened in the past two years are not necessarily the cases that were resolved in those same years. Many of the cases take more than one year or if they were, you know, uh, opened six months into the fiscal year. So um, we had in fiscal year 19, we had uh, 68 age discrimination cases um, that were closed. Um, and, we, and as I mentioned in our testimony, over the past two years, um, that resulted in $1.3 million in damages and penalties um, in age discrimination, I believe, in the workplace cases that were closed um, in those two years. I mean, the number is higher than last year. I mean, that's 2017, which is great. I think what we are looking at, you know, along with the advocate and why we're proposing these legislation, even on, on a, a simple thing like a poster, I mean, in your testimony or your answer, you were talking about you have this Know Your Right poster that lists all the category. We want to highlight age discrimination. And we want the public to see that, you know, age discrimination is not acceptable in New York City. I think there is, like, on whether it's social media, on the subway, bus stop, I think that's what we want to see more focused on this. Because as you say, you know, when you were doing testing program, you don't even do testing. Uh, there's not enough emphasis. And this problem is growing. And we really want to bring more awareness. And that's what we're talking about. You know, simple thing is a poster, more training, focusing on a special task force that can come up with, you know, some solutions and recommendation for us to tackle this issue. And also to really focus on providing resources for older worker, and that's why we're talking about the mayor's office, you know, for older um, workforce development, uh, for older worker. Because even with DIFTA, um, you know, the, the, the program, the, 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 uh, the program that, you know, you provide for age 55 and older, in your testimony, I mean, the jobs that you list are low-paying jobs. It's not, it's not enough for someone to survive on. And it's also part-time, right? It's 20 hour, it's sort of like a training. Uh, but a lot of the older workers that do need to work and support themselves and their families, they want increased opportunity. And that's why we want DIFTA to really coordinate with other agencies to focus on workforce development specifically for older workers so that they can get back into the workforce, get better paying jobs. Um, I mean, that's our goal. I, we don't wanna just settle for low paying jobs. And we've heard, for, heard from you know, workers, yeah, they work at our senior center, they work at our child care center, but a lot of them, you know, maybe they're immigrant or they're older, they really don't have opportunity. But we have workers that actually are well-educated and they need a better, you know, a chance to get a better job. And we need to really start focusing. And that's why one of the legislation, we want the mayor's office to really focus on, you know, older worker. Um, that's why we want to focus on uh, workforce development for older workers. Um, we've got to start paying attention uh, to this population because that number is going to continue to grow. Right? And discrimination happened, as you heard from the first panel, even as young as 40. <laughs> right? But we want to make sure that workers that have to work, that still want to contribute to society, get the opportunity and get this training and support. We want it to be like, I mean, that's what the advocate is fighting for. We want to fight ageism, and it has to be something that's very, very visible. 
So whether it's the poster that should be in all city agency, we want to see, you know, posters in the subway, bus stop, everybody should be talking about that. Because even a, a worker who's 20 now, they better pay attention because that could happen to them 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the legislation that we put together this package to really focus more attention uh, on this issue. And we want to make sure that both, you know, the Commission of Human Rights and DIFTA have the resources to do that. And DIFTA cannot be just providing senior center services, okay? It's got to be much more because the senior population, the older worker, the older adult population is growing. So DIFTA's budget has got to grow, grow, right? We've been fighting on that every single year. Same thing with the Commission. You have an important job to do. So we want to work with you, and we want to grow that support, grow that budget, so that you can help us tackle these critical, important issues. So I hope that we will get support from the le for the legislation, uh, and we can follow up uh, with your agency. You know, to to work out if there's other suggestions that you have to make it better. Um, and how we can really coordinate on this. Thank you, and we look forward to those conversations. Um, you know, we are committed. We know that, you know, while we have cases and we're prosecuting and investigating those cases, there are far more uh, experiences of discrimination, um, whether it's overt or implicit, um, and there is a, and we know that there is a societal, um, you, you know, there's, this is, a, this is larger than cases filed at the commission. This is a, a bigger conversation that we should all be having, and we are committed to engaging with you and many of the advocates in the room to continue this conversation and think about ways to really shift the conversation on this, both through using the law, but also through um, you know, having conversations with the business community and, you know, and other stakeholders as well. Um, again, yes, absolutely right. Um, I, I think we've said a few times now that um, we have a shared goal in this regard, and I think that's a really important first step, and we're happy to have a continued dialogue. Just really quickly about sort of the, the wage. Um, you might know, and I'm sure you do, that um, uh, these uh, CSEP jobs are minimum wage jobs, I know. which they are $15. We're actually really proud of that minimum wage here in the city across the country. You know, is very different. The federal minimum wage has been stagnant for years. Um, so we're incredibly proud of that. Obviously, we want to continue to engage the council in thinking through how best to sort of leverage that money that we're getting from the federal government to, to uh, implement this program, and we're happy to have those discussions. Definitely. I mean, but what I hear, you know, from the, some of the workers that there's no benefits and no pension. So when you're talking about somebody age 55, they might be around for a long time. Sure. So if there is no benefit and then no pension plan, you know, that doesn't really help them. So we really got to work on that. That is good paying job with benefits that they can live on. And, and that's and the ultimate goal, right? Direct employment. So we want to open their network and get them to these uh, these jobs so that um, these uh, age competent employers are, are hiring their moms. So yes, exactly right. Yeah, and that's why we ought to, we have to work together to make sure that the older workers are visible. Yes. And they still have a lot to contribute, experience, work ethic, all that's got to be promoted. Um, so that's why we really need to work together and with the advocates. So thank you uh, to the panel for today, and I'm going to call up the next. It's just one quick, um, yes. just quick housekeeping. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Commissioner Raj's testimony. We have a, a slightly updated version than the one oh. that you have. Just with a, there's a, just a couple little things that we have corrected, and we've already handed it up to committee council, I believe. Oh. So, just wanted to put that on the record. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Uh, Jenna Gladfector from Live On New York. Bobby Sackman, Radical Age Movement. Christian uh, Gonzalez Rivera. And Ruth Fingelstein. Regina, why don't you come up too? Regina Masson from also Radical Age Movement. Hmm? 
Oh, Regina left? Okay. Well, Bobby will take care of it. We're gonna uh, have to put you on the clock, but I give us the highlights, um, and then we can also ask questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Bobby. <laughs> Bobby Sackman with uh, Radical Age Movement. But I'm also here, as you'll see in my testimony, testifying on behalf of the New York State Alliance for Retired Americans, which just briefly, um, began as a union-based retiree group, but has opened up to all retirees um, and has over 400,000 members across the state. And, this, and Radical Age is actually a member of theirs, and they're very interested in, in this work discrimination issue. Um, so I, really what's in my testimony is, is going through the bills. Uh, so first of all, I do want to you know, thank you uh, chairs of these committees and Councilwoman Chin and Ayala in particular for introducing the bills. Um, the testimony by the, the, the female reporters I think was moving to all of us uh, for sure. So I think um, we, we were given the opportunity over the summer, different you know, advocates came together to review a draft of, of the uh, bills and we thank you for that. It's a good collaboration. And, you know, as usual in the legislative process, some of our recommendations were accepted and some of our recommendations weren't. So we're back. Um, and we've had a further discussion where we've had some other, um, I think, good ideas come up. So I thought what I would do really quickly, I don't have to go through each one. You, I've highlighted where, you know, um, Either you put in some new language, which we appreciate. But one of the key recommendations I'd like to raise is the bill that talks about the task force and the bill that talks about the Older Worker Development Office. Um, in our discussion, we realized that the task force, in a way, should be tasked with coming up with the blueprint that will become the Older Worker Development Task Force. You know, maybe that seems obvious, maybe it doesn't, but it wasn't so obvious until we started talking about it. That could be done, again, we're not the legislators, I don't write bills. It could be done in one bill together, or if now that there are two bills, adding some legislative language, and that's what's in the testimony. Something about that this shall be a blueprint, because then the time that's needed to go through the task force, it really gives it teeth. And then you do need, and I, we appreciate the language about the six-month interim report because we were concerned about the year-long process, but th then it gives it really teeth that you do need a year to really produce what we hope will now become something real. The other thing about the, that development office is, which by the way is a great idea, I mean terrific, you know, it's long been needed. Just to consider that rather than it being a separate office, there is the mayor's office of workforce development, and there is a model there, the youth, um, the youth, um, uh, I'm sorry, Center for Youth Employment. Um, and perhaps making an older worker um, development piece part of that already existing office, rather than off on its own, again, just out of concern that it could get lost, it may not get the attention it needs. Um, and it seems like the youth employment office has had some substantial money put into it, which is, of course, what we're hoping for older workers. I have 12 million in my testimony. I just found out that actually the updated number is that city council has put in $19 million. Now, I'm around long enough to know that that's a good chunk of change. And, and good that, that you guys are doing that, but boy, wouldn't we like to see that for older workers. And also the, the fund for the city of New York is involved and, and private businesses. So again, maybe thinking of it instead of a separate office, part and parcel of an already existing mayoral 
office. Um, and, and I think just fine, I'm trying to see if there's anything, we went through everything and everything, you're gonna hear more about the testing piece. I'm not gonna, not gonna go on about that. The only thing I, I do wanna add quickly is, is the fiscal impact. Yes, there's a fiscal impact. And we all live with the fact that nobody thinks it takes any money or it takes very little money, whether it's the Department for the Aging or other city agencies to do these kinds of programs. This is new. We need to build the capacity, as you just heard, with DIFTA, the Human Rights Commission, the testing. Uh, we, 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 uh, we're very pleased that a fifth bill was added about anti-ageism training. That could be done within a city uh, department. It could be done in the contracted out basis, but that takes money. Develop a curriculum in doing ongoing training, developing a database. So we shouldn't cheat ourselves from the get-go, and maybe that's something we could work with your office and the city's fin you know, finance uh, committee to come up with some numbers so we really go into this saying, this is what will make this real. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Oh, and also, I'm sorry, I'm submitting Regina Matson's um, testimony. Um, the guard has it just on her behalf. She couldn't stay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, good late afternoon. Um, I'm Ruth Finkelstein, and I'm the executive director of Hunter College's Brookdale Center on Aging. And with me, um, I'm honored to introduce my colleague, uh, Christiane Gonzalez Rivera, our director of strategic policy initiatives. Um, since we're both uh, experts in this area and came to it, kind of by separate routes and have different areas of expertise. I'm very appreciative of your allowing us each to uh, briefly summarize our testimony, and we will both be brief. Um, I wanna just frame one thing. Obviously, we're in strong support of the effort that um, both of you are putting in in leading the council forward into this incredibly important area of having New York City lead the nation in how can we um, enact and monitor and enforce the strongest possible age discrimination laws. And we are eager to be of service to make that effort successful. I want to frame it in a reminder that currently the full age of Social Security claiming is 70 years old. Therefore, when we have a situation where people are losing their jobs or having diminutions in their work status because they're 40 and they're 50 and they're 60 and they're 65, we are literally pushing them over a cliff where they can't possibly age in a healthful or productive way or even pay their rent. So this issue, I was interested to hear the human rights commissioners talk about areas that are emergencies. And in some ways, I think this area too is another emergency in human rights because we've come so far apart between how antiquated our cultural expectations and laws are and our actual life expectancy and needs. And they're really far apart at this point and we have to play catch up. Now, that's enough. Um, let me turn not to saying nice things about all the bills we support 100% and completely, but cut to the chase of a couple of modifications. We'll both be doing that with different pieces of the legislation. First of all, we love the, the posters, brilliant and beautiful and wonderful. The training ditto, but he, at Brookdale, we have a lot of experience 
training frontline government workers. And our experience is that experiential, hands-on training is so much more effective than click, click, click through these mandatory online trainings, which we all know we do while we're multitasking, we're on the phone and we're making dinner for the kid and we're going click, click, click. But yet, if you get into a room with skilled trainers and they're role playing and doing exercises and giving you the experience of what they're trying to train you about, you learn it in a whole different way. So maybe that can at least be an additional component. Maybe it's prescribed for those agencies and employers that are having some trouble, right? Um, though I wouldn't want such a wonderful thing to be a punishment. But then we need to have a separate, longer conversation about the whole concept of how is this situation going to be monitored, evaluated, and tested. Because while the intention of requiring five testers to go out every year and do age discrimination is absolutely laudatory, the methodology is insufficient. And we know some stuff about that. We know it as academics. We know it from experience. We know the body of research that other people have done about those methods. And we would be happy to be like a low threshold, low pain um, advisor um, to anybody who wants to be improving that. And I believe that as we are successful in expanding awareness, we have to have a very sensitive monitoring mechanism that doesn't make the mistake of saying expanded reporting means expanded problem. It's just like when we expanded awareness of you know domestic violence and reporting went up. Well, that didn't mean, that wasn't bad, that was good, because it meant that more of the violence that existed was being reported. So first we're gonna see more reporting because awareness is gonna go up and then we want to see more prosecution, and then we want to see more prevention. And so we need very delicate um, monitoring each step of the way so that we can see each step of our progress and see where we need to improve our practice to keep the progress great. Thank you. Hi again, Christian Gonzalez from the Brookdale Center. So I'm going to uh, focus my comments on uh, bills number 1693 and 1694, so the task force and the, the Office of Workforce Development. And I'll keep them brief because they reflect the fact that Bobby and I have discussed this. <laughs> um, but we do believe very strongly that the task force and the Office of Workforce Development do need to be linked. I mean, just, I mean, the fact that if you have a task force, the very best way that, that, to ensure that they stay on task and that the report issues recommendations that somebody can use is to give them somebody to use it. And so in this case, I mean, it's like we're, you're already having the great idea of having both this task force and this office. This office, I mean, basically this task force should create the blueprint for that this office should use. Um, and again, I mean, it's like there is precedent in this. I mean, it's like, I, as you know very well, when uh, de Blasio came into, into office, he convened the Jobs for New Yorkers task force. And so the job of this task force was to create a blueprint for the uh, Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. I mean, it's like the creator of the report, Career Pathways, uh, One City Working Together, that ended up being the blueprint for this office. And, you know, while not all of its aims were have been realized in, the, um, in all of this period of time, at least that, put, that made that report so much more effective than it would have been had it just been issued out into the ether and not given a place to, to land. Similarly, I mean, it's like, again, following that same theme as the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, within that office, as, as Bobby mentioned, there is the Center for Youth Employment. And that Center for Youth Employment has been extremely successful in increasing the number of young people who go through employment programs in New York City, creating new partnerships that have, re that have resulted in new programming. And, for ex and one great example is actually the $19 million that the council has invested in the Work, Learn, and Grow program. Um, that is now being run through DYCD, and that is in part because of the efforts of the Center for Youth Employment and all of its partners, um, including uh, the Fund for the City of New York, including private employers, including the council, and including the administration as well. 
So that kind of a model where it's not just on one office like NIFTA, or it's not just on one commission to do this work, or one office that might be isolated, that work done in partnership is so much more powerful. So along those lines, I, we, believe, we, we recommend that the, office not be, that the Office of Older Adult Workforce not be isolated on its own, but rather be included in the existing Mayor's Office of Workforce Development as a special program that work, works across sectors. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. And again, I mean, it's like we think this is a great uh, follow-up to the historic hearing that you had last year. You know, for the first time, really putting age discrimination on the map. It was great to be out in the rally and see so many people, you know, really support, uh, put support behind this. And it's time to put ageism on the map, and this is a great place to start with something that affects the livelihoods of so many older adults. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jenna Gladfelder and I'm here representing Live on New York. We're a um, nonprofit organization and our members consist of um, community-based organizations that provide really core services to older adults, such as senior centers, home delivered meals, caregiving services, et cetera. Um, and on one hand, I feel like what else can I say after so many strong voices and advocates and personal stories that we've heard today that really um, just reinforce the need for this conversation. So I thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Um, I just want to say, uh, from Live on New York's perspective, we echo a lot of the recommendations that are here, and it's outlined in our testimony. But first and foremost, um, we just want to say thank you again so much to Council Members um, Chin and Ayala for putting together this legislative package. We see it as just such a um, necessary thing. And in light of that, I just want to say that Live on New York um, believes that it is critical that we view aging as the normative life process that it is. In other words, we are all aging. We find ourselves in an exciting time in which the future of aging itself is dynamic and evolving. Perhaps like never before, there is no one size fits all for the aging process. While previous generations may have lived by a more consistent set of milestones, today we all experience life and aging differently and therefore deserve the opportunity to thrive in accordance with our own desire, drive, and values, regardless of our age. For some, this may mean an early and long-awaited retirement. For others, a second act in an unexplored career path. For most, however, it means the continued economic pressures of an often unequal society. This economic reality means that many older adults simply cannot afford the fiscal implications of a frequently age-based and at times discriminatory society and workplace. Even beyond economic pressures, older adults should not be shunned to the opportunity to, fu to fulfill the innate desire to have utility, be productive, and contribute. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, by the year 2024, workers 55 or older will represent 25% of the workforce. By contrast, in 1994, those 55 and older represented just 11%. And yet today, while many um, people are working longer, age discrimination, and particularly in the workforce, is still very real. It is ingrained in the stereotypes of how older adults live, behave, and work, which can have a seriously damaging effect on their job opportunities and overall well-being. And while we heard about um, how age discrimination is highly underreported, um, we've also heard that the most common cases that are filed involve uh, an individual not being hired due to age, followed closely by those being passed over for job promotions. So these occurrences have a clear fiscal impact on the individual and may be more common than those um, enumerated given the aforementioned lack of uh, reporting. For already a marginalized uh, populations such as women, immigrants, and minority communities, these age-related injustices often serve to exacerbate existing inequalities. Inequalities such as lost wages due to caregiving, persistent wage gaps within communities of color, and lack of pension options for a multitude of workers means that the financial margins that are so slim um, uh, that the effects of age discrimination can be devastating. Um, again, we just want to reiterate some of the, uh, the recommendations that my colleagues said here. Um, we support those, specifically um, Intro 1694, um, which is housing the Center for Older Workers under the um, Office for Workforce Development, just to enable employees um, to capitalize on existing resources. Um, yes, and that's all I'll say there. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much to this panel, and thank you for your advocacy and helping you know, with our bills. Okay, one more panel. Uh, AARP, Chris Vadello. Leila Malamud, New York Legal Assistant Group.
Uh, Karen, uh, the Legal Aid Society. Kakego? <laughs> okay, see. Uh, Great Waltman. And uh, Katie. Napatoski, Napatoski. Sorry if I mispronounced your name, but please come up. If anyone else wants to testify, uh, you, please fill out a, a slip with the, the sergeant. Hi. Karen Kakes, um, Director of the Employment Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Uh, the Employment Law Unit represents low-wage workers throughout New York City with most types of employment claims, uh, including discrimination claims and including age discrimination claims. So we want to um, we want to thank you for for uh, holding this hearing. We want to thank you for advancing this legislation. It's uh, it's extremely important, and we're we're um, we're happy to support all of the all of the bills that have been introduced. Oh. Um, we did want to point out um, a, f a few things, and um, one is that while the New York City human rights law is very broad in its protections, as it was discussed, it has uh, 26 categories where it is um, providing protection, um, but it does not cover anyone who works at a small employer. You need four employees to be covered by the New York uh, City Human Rights Law, and that is uh, that is a problem because there are lots of there are lots of workers out there, many of them older workers, who work at a place um, where there are less than four employees. So we would encourage the City Council to focus on that issue, um, and all that needs to be done is to eliminate the number four in the definition of an employer. An employer should be defined as somebody who has workers working for them, not somebody who has four or more employees working for them. So that's one issue we just, we did want to highlight. Um, another issue is, um, is, uh, is enforcement um, and um, and the, the city commission um, testified about their efforts, and we appreciated all of the the questioning about them about do they need more resources, um, and to to the extent that they get additional resources, we would really encourage the commission and encourage the city council to encourage the the commission to put um, to put uh, those resources toward their mediation program. Mm -hmm. Their mediation program is excellent. Um, we have filed many uh, cases at the commission. We have had the commission refer um, workers to us who filed pro se, and then we represent them in mediation, um, and they have one mediator there. She is wonderful. She is uh, very capable of um, bringing about a resolution in difficult cases, but she's one person, and so we have waited more than a year to get before her uh, for a mediation. So it is just, it's, you know, particularly in the case of older workers, it's too long to wait. Um, and uh, it is. It would be a great alternative rather than having to go through the entire investigation process, which takes one to two years, to be streamlined into a mediation process. So if they were able to hire several more competent uh, mediators, I think you would see a lot of resolution resolutions reached uh, reach much quicker and with good results for the workers who are experiencing discrimination. So again, thank you for, um, for holding the hearing in and advancing the legislation. Thank you. Can you press the button? Hello, my name is Katie Noplatarski. Thank you for taking my testimony. I'm here on behalf of myself. I worked as a teacher and teacher coach for the Department of Education's Office of Adult and Continuing Education for more than 25 years, ending my time there four years ago in June 2015 when I transferred to another DOE division. During the 2013 to 2018 superintendency of the former, OAC, the former OACE superintendent, Rosemary Mills, Scores of staff members were forced out through harassment, intimidation, a toxic work environment, and the targeting of staff, including teacher support and administration. The majority of those who left were older employees, 50 plus. In fact, 12 staff members filed an age discrimination complaint, and I can <clears throat> tell you more about that later if you'd like. It was dismissed. 
Um, this forced exodus weakened the fabric of, of OACE immeasurably. Over the course of about three years, a vast store of accumulated institutional and educational knowledge was wiped out as senior staff was purged from the roles. In the light of this experience, I welcome this legislation and the safeguards that it intends to impose. I thank the council members and the council for putting forth these initiatives as I believe that workplaces across the city should be well informed of the law as applies to age discrimination. I would also like to request the following, that in whatever means possible, during training or in print, that the worth of seniors is also conveyed in ways that cannot be legislated. That our culture needs to treasure and appreciate elders for their knowledge, experience, and wisdom all of which are invaluable components of a workplace, home, and world, and that this should be communicated. Perhaps part of the trainings could explore the value of elders within various cultures in order to strengthen our own culture's appreciation of our seniors' wonderful gifts. These qualities for the years 2013 to 2018 were not valued within OACE to the de detriment of all. I welcome this legislation and the beneficial effects it can have within our city workplaces and our culture at large. Thank you. I'd just also like to add that the new <clears throat> OACE administration is a vast improvement and thank the council, um, the school chancellor and the city <clears throat> and the city council, especially Drum and Traeger for um, bringing about this change. Thank you. And I'd just like to say that the uh, complaint which was made by 12 or, or 14 uh, <clears throat> teachers uh, was not dealt with by the commission um, as a whole. They dealt with it individually rather than looking at it holistically. At the <clears throat> so they didn't look at it as a trend? No. It's happening and they didn't investigate? They just no. did individual cases? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I mean, DOE, I mean, with a, we've heard other incidents where more, you know, mature teacher or teacher who are more experienced, who've been in the system a long time, are sort of forced out or forced to retire early because it costs more. Because a lot of principals see is that, well, I can hire two, two mm -hmm. teachers um, if I let go mm -hmm. of the, the one that's been there a long time. Yes, and there was a definite, if you looked at the information and the data, there was a definite relationship there um, between the senior teachers, how they were rated and, um, and forced out often, but that wasn't looked at by the commission. They only looked at the cases individually, not holistically. Okay, we could probably follow up with them on that. Thank you, okay. thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Lila Malamut, and I'm here today on behalf of the New York Legal Assistance Group. I'm a paralegal with the Employment Law Project, and I have with me Alyssa Evans, who's an attorney with the Employment Law Project. Um, NILAG is a nonprofit organization that provides free legal services to low-income New Yorkers who can't afford uh, private attorneys, and our Employment Law Project uh, does a variety of of types of cases, um, the majority of which are discrimination, and a lot of them are age discrimination cases. Um, NILAG and the Employment Law Project really commends the City Council for holding this hearing and addressing this really pressing issue. As um, many people have mentioned uh, before me, more and more Americans are choosing to stay in the task force, in the workforce longer um, than they used to, um, which is why it's imper imperative that we strengthen our legislation protecting older workers. Um, through our work with NILAG's Employment Law Project, we've become intimately familiar with the uh, fact patterns of instant age discrimination. I think it's worth just going into some of them to bring to light um, what this looks like really on the ground. Um, for example, oftentimes our clients will describe supervisors who make overt comments targeting their age, saying they're too old to be doing this job, especially if, if it's a physical job, um, or oftentimes also asking them when they plan to retire. Um, other clients um, experience ageism in more subtle ways by, for example, receiving unwarranted negative performance evaluations or being disparately disciplined compared to younger workers. Um, we had one client, for example, who um, was age 70 and he was fired after 25 years of service at an advertising sales company for not meeting the sales revenue quotient. Um, but upon further investigation, we found that the company was utilizing a facially neutral policy that required 
workers with more years of experience to meet a higher monthly quota in order to unfairly penalize and get rid of the older workers. Um, and we settled his case after demonstrating that significantly younger workers who had also consistently missed their quotas were not being similarly disciplined. Um, despite the pervasiveness of age discrimination, um, clients have an especially hard time proving their claims because of the higher causation standard under the ADA. Um, and this, I think, is particularly exacerbated in failure to hire cases where well-qualified applicants are passed over for a job because of their age. Um, in these cases, applicants often lack access to the kind of evidence they really need to prove to make a but-for showing, um, which is evidence that other older and qualified applicants were also rejected or that younger applicant applicants were hired in their places. Um, and I think this is why the work that you're doing here and the legislation that you've proposed um, is so vital, especially, um, we're especially enthusiastic about introduction number 1695, which will require the Commission on Human Rights to conduct regular age discrimination uh, testing programs. Um, and I think these testing programs could be really vital to generate the much needed evidence um, in failure to hire cases where applicants don't usually have the kind of evidence they need to make out those claims. Um, so thank you again for um, inviting me to testify. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much uh, for staying so long and for testifying. And we look forward to working with you. And if you have any other suggestion in terms of the legislation, please let us know because we are pushing to get these legislation passed as quickly as possible. Is there anyone else that want to testify? If not, I want to thank everyone for being here today. And uh, the hearing is adjourned.